Hello and welcome to Makers Dev episode number 53. Chris, how's it going? It is going all right. Um, I spent the last week, two weeks, very busy on my final labs for my master's. Um, if you are listening to this in the future, I apologize for episode 51 being late. Uh, it is still, there is something wrong with the audio, so that's still being edited. Uh, yeah, but I am done. The last lab was due yesterday, so I'm done and I'm happy. I also apologize. That's a that's a duty that we both share that I have uh, shirked on you. <laughs> so thank you for uh, making it less light than it would have been if I had been in charge of it. Uh, also, casually, you're just coding a self driving car as a homework assignment. Uh, that's that's pretty cool. Tell me more about this project and what the what the final was. What your challenges were. What you learned. What you overcame. Yeah. Give me the give me the juice. So yeah, the final project was is. The program is called Super Tux Kart, which is like an open source ver version of Mario Kart. Um, and there is a mode in it where you play soccer against two opponents. And so it's ice hockey is the mode that they use. So the, the idea was you have to code an AI to play ice hockey using this kind of Mario Kart thing. Um, there were loads of problems <laughs> with that. Like I expected it to take a certain amount of time, but they, so they released the project a little late. They were, it was very nebulous what you had to do. Like they previously made it like open-ended or previously they purposely made it open-ended um but it was like it was a lot harder than it should have been um mm. uh some of which was because of the way like they they you can only submit to the online grader like three times and if you um and it was very random like my results like the better your agent was the more less random it would be but uh like your score could go up and down like 50 percent um just based on randomness maybe not quite that high, like 25 30 percent mm. So it was just a very frustrating experience all around. Um, but I did it. I eked out my A in the class, like just barely. <laughs> and so my, my wife was like, you don't have to get an A. And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> and so I spent way, way too much time doing it. Uh, but I did learn a bunch. So that was good. Um, I chose the reinforcement learning path. There was a few different paths you could choose. Um, and I'm happy about that because now I know about reinforcement learning. I hadn't used that before. But basically the idea is you have an agent, which is your driver in this case. And it acts in the environment, which is the video game. It like plays the video game. And you give it rewards when it does something good. And you penalize it when it does something bad. And then you run it for a really long time. And um, hopefully it learns how to drive. Um, there are other ways to do reinforcement learning that I did as well. But that's that's the primary like way to do it. And that sounds sort of simple in practice. Or in, in, you know, in theory. But in practice, there's some really important tricks that I did not understand at all before starting it. Now I understand those tricks. And so now I can actually use reinforcement learning for things. So that's good. Wonderful. I had never heard reinforcement learning phrased that way, that you're rewarding it for doing good things and punishing it for doing bad things. I'm reminded of one of my favorite books, Don't Shoot the Dog, talking about uh, effective ways of animal training, uh, including with humans. And it's a very similar process. Uh, it's it's funny how these things sort of converge of like everything right. is everything is animal training and everything is um, training AIs. I'm curious about uh, for a task as complicated as you have to drive a cart around in this virtual ice rink and score goals. The obvious thing to do is, ah, you get points for scoring goals and any time you're not scoring goals, you get minus points. And it seems like that wouldn't work because it's just too abstract. Uh, that, that, that would be... That would be way too harsh of a of a teacher. Uh, how do you reward incrementally for going in the direction of scoring a goal? Yeah, so you've hit on the the problem of reinforcement learning, which is reward shaping. How do you figure out what reward you're going to give? Um, if you have uh, a big enough model with a long enough time frame and a low enough learning rate, then it would work just fine to say you get points for getting goals and you get penalized for not getting goals um but that you know as time goes to infinity that would work <laughs> um uh and so what you need to do in the meantime is come up with more immediate rewards um so you might imagine for example if you drive and you get closer to the goal then that is a positive or sorry closer to the puck then that's a that's a positive thing mm. and if you get the puck closer to the goal then that's positive and then if you get the mm. puck in the goal then that's like 100 times positive mm. um but there's problems with that. Sometimes the the best solution is to run really hard into the puck, which flies in front of you. So you're actually increasing your distance from the puck, but the puck is going closer to the goal. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's one thing. And then you so you can come up with all these like scenarios um, about how to do reward shaping, and it's a really really difficult problem. Um, partly also because reinforcement learning can take a really long time 
because you have to simulate, um, you know, every time you change your reward, basically. And it can just take a long time to simulate. And so you don't know if your reward function works or not until you simulate for a lot of time. And then it mm. scores start either going down or up. Um, so, yeah, it can be super, super tricky. That's what I found. Um, and I did several other things other than just pure, like, uh, so that particular algorithm is called reinforce. <laughs> so yeah, funny enough, but um, there's lots of other things you can do to try to make it a little easier. And so I chose a bunch of different things as well. But yeah, re- reward shaping is is the key problem in reinforcement learning. Were those the approximate shapes of your rewards? Get more yeah. points if you're closer to the buck, and more points if the buck is closer to the goal. Yep. Cool. And yeah, that and that's worked. That got you an A. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, the actual scoring of points was only worth 30% of the uh, thing, which is good because I got, so I scored a point in about half the games I played against the AI, um, okay. up to three points to get a hundred percent of that 30%, you would have to score a point in basically all the games, like an average of one point per game. Okay. So I did not get there. Um, but it was only worth 30% of the final, which is worth only 30% of the grade. And I got a hundred percent on the write up part, which is basically like, you could still get a hundred percent on the write up, but describing everything that you tried and i tried a lot of different things um so my agent was not particularly good partly because so i had a very tricky bug that i didn't realize that's the other thing about ai in general and reinforcement learning in particular is i had this bug and everything still worked everything was training sort of but i fixed this bug on the last day and things started training a lot better but i just didn't have you know like like the three days i needed to run the thing to get really good so if i started it now and ran it then in three days i'd probably have a pretty good agent um but I only found that bug on the very last day. So it's just super tricky and kind of annoying. <laughs> yeah. Oof. What was the bug? Um, I, okay, this is very technical, but I switched from a Bernoulli distribution to a normal distribution inside of my reinforcement learning. Uh, All right. Algorithm, right. <laughs> Please start to explain what that means. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as part of reinforcement learning, you have to, you don't just select an action. You have to select a probability over actions um, because it because basically what your cart is doing is it's doing slightly different things than what your model is telling it to do and then it's checking to see whether those slight differences are better or worse than what your model originally told it to do that's sort of the crux of how that works a Bernoulli distribution um is a set uh distribution over probabilities meaning you can't like choose a standard deviation um it's going to pick for you based on probabilities you give it uh, but a normal distribution you can choose a standard deviation and so what was happening was the Bernoulli distribution was making my cart go off course too much time to it like too frequently um and with a normal distribution i was able to set a smaller standard deviation so it didn't do that i knew that and i fixed that early what i didn't do is bernoulli is from zero to one and standard devi- and normal i would have from negative one to one and i had a scaling factor in there and i left the scaling factor in <laughs> and i should not have done that uh, okay and that that ran for a really long time and it just wasn't really doing anything and then as soon as i took that scaling factor out it, it started working gotcha gotcha so okay just, yeah you, you... <laughs> i i understood 30 percent of that uh <laughs> let me this this may be a lost cause let me let me try to repeat it back and see if i understand when making tweaks to your model you have to compare what you whatever you were doing before to whatever the tweak was to be able to judge did the tweak make it better or worse yep and there are two different methods and probably more but There's there were more, there were yeah. two that you were thinking of in this project for ways to judge if the tweak was better or worse one of them was using a bernoulli distribution the other was using a standard distribution uh a, a, like a normal normal yep. curve a bell curve and the ways that those two oh you know what i don't understand is how how do those distributions relate to figuring out how much something is better or worse what what's that connection yeah, so the reason that it works is because in PyTorch, those are uh, differentiable. Differentiable, they have a derivative. Okay. And so your model can backprop through them. So so when a neural network is, is improving, what it does is it basically has to have a series of pure math functions that it can go backwards through in order to figure out how to change its weights. Okay. And so Bernoulli, normal, all those distributions are back backpropable. Back, back, they have a derivative. And, nice. um, yeah, and... Um, uh, and they take in uh, probabilities and give you um, a distinction. So, so what you do is like, I want to drive forward with like 99% probability. And so your, your agent will like 99% of the time will select forward, but 1% of the time it may select backwards. Mm-hmm. And then it'll check to see if backwards got a higher reward than forwards basically. Okay. And it does that with something called a log probability. But anyway, um, 
So that's what makes reinforcement learning all work, which is, by the way, what I didn't know before. Like, I was like, okay, you have it do stuff and you give it rewards, but how does that work? And the rewards, what it's comparing against actually is your actual actions versus what you predicted your action was supposed to be and what's better or worse. Okay. Um, very technical. Uh, sorry if that's very confusing, but uh, yeah, that's what, it, that's what it's for. I think I'm, I think I'm going to table for now that I still don't understand how that distribution connects with comparing what you did but i'll we'll, we'll, so, we'll set that aside so yeah so the, the distribution or, is what the, it's it's what picks forward and backwards based on okay. the percentage chance so you have, you say 99 percent of the time i want to go forwards and so bernoulli will so bernoulli will do one percent of the time go backwards yes what normal will do is it lets you select how big that distribution is and so you can say like only 0.1 percent of the time i want to go backwards and that means i drive forward more often okay um, in in yeah. a bernoulli distribution the the percent that you go against what you think is going to be the right thing to do is set yeah and in a normal distribution you get to decide how crazy you want it to act yep exactly yeah bernoulli it's only going to act crazy one percent of the time normal distribution is going to act crazy the percent that you tell it based on what uh what uh oh uh standard, standard deviation, deviation you want you want it to go yep. okay i'm with it so okay <laughs> so going back <laughs> when when you were when you switched from bernoulli to standard deviation, which sounds like a reasonable thing you would do because standard deviation now is going to give you more flexibility and you can tell it to act a little more or less crazy. Uh, the the range of one of the inputs or one of the outputs in that system outputs, in Bernoulli uh, but, was but, negative one to one and in standard deviation was zero to one. And you, other, way, other way around, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Yep. Cool. Ah, all right. I, I feel like I <laughs> you got, got it. it. <laughs> Sorry if I lost a bunch of people, but yeah. <laughs> You you have taken me mostly along for the ride <laughs> it's, uh, in uh, in the, the minimum case. Uh, I I would love to just take a step back for a second. You as a homework assignment built a brain that can drive a car well enough to play soccer. That's amazing. <laughs> that how cool is it that that's the world that we're living in? You you're at a school studying to be able to do that, and you did it. <laughs> and like you wrote a report about it. And you got more points for your robot to be able to score goals. Like, incredible. The, the, if you had told me this was possible like 20 years ago, I would have been like, that's amazing. What else could it, do you do? You have homework assignments where you can send robots to the moon and the, the biggest hole they dig and the, the biggest castle they build gets the most points? Like, it's man it's living in the future is uh is really cool and it's really cool that you're studying these cool future things i like that you are so enthusiastic about it because right now i'm not really because i just <laughs> i spent probably 60 hours in the last week fighting this oh, thing man. just to get what i got so yeah 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 I, I think it's really cool that you're uh able to do that 60 hours my gosh it's uh that's a more than a full-time job uh cool what's up next for you is there another fun homework assignment uh, yeah, no. So, well, that, that's done. that's it for the semester. So, about a month with no classes, which is nice. I have to figure out what to do next. Um, so, I can finally get back to some uh, bootstrapping stuff, which I haven't done in a long time. <laughs> um, I sort of feel like I just want to, like, relax. Um, but that's, like, next week. Next week, I'm going on vacation, so I can just relax. This week, I may also, because I just spent a bunch, a bunch of hours. But, um, yeah, so I've been thinking about uh, Acorn Chat more and more. And we talked about this before, and I kind of got dropped because I had to pick up the slack on these labs that i was doing but i'm gonna get back to it now i have all the work that i had done just before all that happened uh, which is like a bunch of pre-work so i know like what i'm gonna do um yeah so i think that's the next step is to get that thing in the slack app store which was my plan <laughs> several weeks ago which i had to drop um yeah i'm gonna pick that back up cool i'm excited to talk with you more about bootstrap and stuff i, th I think ostensibly the reason we started this podcast and then it turned into just like yeah whatever whatever we want to talk about whatever is yeah. fun yeah uh which i like cool uh what is I, I i'm totally on board with you on taking some time off uh i've felt a lot of advantage to doing that over these past few trips i've taken and i have an exciting update for you uh on those lines um but just to just to map it out, just so I'm ready uh, for the upcoming development to Acorn Chat. What's what's the high level overview of what the direction is? What's what are the next few projects to be focused on? Yeah, so I don't remember exactly, but it was um, there are a couple things which are like part of my core thesis about it, uh, which I have to do. Oh, it like it like doesn't go offline when you go offline. I really wanted mm -hmm. to do that. 
and then there's a few Slack apps for specific things that I have to do to get in there. Um, and then most of it is like documentation. Like uh, right now the website is actually like sparse. It doesn't really tell you what it does. So I have to like fill out what it does and documentation. And um, uh, there, there's like a lot of sort of um, higher level business things, not development necessarily to get it into the Slack app store. Um, and so that that is a lot of work. Got it. I didn't remember that it wasn't already on the Slack app store. Yeah, that, that's yeah. the obvious next thing to do. Cool. Yep. I'm excited. Um, bum, bum, bum. Do you have any, tr like, like, of course, there's these little check boxes to check of like, oh, well, it'd be nice if it had documentation and it has to have this thing to, to be able to be on the Slack app store. Um, do you feel like there's any sort of emotional block of like, oh, man, when it's in the Slack app store, then it's real and people are going to start using it and now there's going to be like a support burden on it? Um, or does that feel pretty straightforward of like, well, no, it, it really is just this handful of stuff and then uh, I'm, I'd feel good about it being launched? Yeah, no, I don't think there's an emotional block because if people are using it, then they'll be paying me. <laughs> this is different than Medium Place, <laughs> which has a free tier. This has no free tier. Um, yeah. So if there is support burden, that means people are actually paying me. So that, that would be good. Um, okay. Although, so actually, I think one person is using it right now. I can see in the logs that things are happening and I don't force payment, which which means they're not paying me. <laughs> And so okay. I need a force payment that is on my list of things. Uh, if you use it, you know, there's probably, you know, a 14 day free trial or something like that. And if you use it past that, then it's going to force you to pay. So uh, it does not do that yet. And I think one person is taking advantage of that. <laughs> gotcha. How could they have done that? I guess through your website. Yeah. You can just they... sign up right now and it doesn't okay. make you pay. Like, like it, there's a big banner at the top that says, choose your plan, but then everything else still works. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just okay. need to dis disable everything else. This is this is functional though. Like it's working yeah. in Slack. You just have to go through your website and not through the Slack App Store. Yep. Oh, wonderful. Okay. I thought I thought it was like in development mode or something where you had to have it running locally and get Uh no, yeah, it works. Cool. Oh, yeah. Get it. What how long is that gonna take? Get it get it on the Slack App Store. What's <laughs> I know like, relax, of course, but you know, it, go, take an hour and then get this on the Slack App Store and then go back to relaxing. I know. That's what I said like several weeks ago and then <laughs> life happened <laughs> okay um i i feel like this is the thing i can hold you to for next week that that it seems pretty straightforward just to if you already have the thing working like <laughs> my gosh don't yeah if if the feature of take it offline if uh when you go offline in the slack app store if if you hit any sort of wall in that i would just be like ah I'll get it in the next <laughs> release and just just get it up there uh yeah that's that's my official advice as your unofficial boss <laughs> thanks on official boss <laughs> you're welcome um cool i have an exciting update also about uh SAS business stuff that starts with something very bad happening i got a facebook message from uh this guy named ian he's been one of my most uh loyal and vocal customers of file inbox since <laughs> i've had it and it was a message to my personal Twitter account. And I was like, ah, oh, that's weird. How, like, you would have had to work a little bit to find me on Twitter. And the message said, file inbox is down, which sent me into a panic. Uh, it's been a few years since I've gotten a message like that. But uh, all sorts of the, those old panicky emotions of like, oh, no, what's like, how mm -hmm. big is this fire? And what's, is it, is it just like, it was automatically restarting and it's back up again already. So I go to fileinbox.com and I get the uh, Cloudflare page that's like, ah, we cannot contact your server. We're getting a 503 Oof. error with the server. So that's just like, oh man, this is really bad. Um, and I don't know how bad it is because I have been pathologically not checking my customer support emails. So it could have been hours, days. Mm -hmm. I don't know that this thing is just down. Ah, so... I have this new laptop and I, I hadn't set up any of my environment or anything for uh, the, the old Rails app, the way that things have been working. So that was the whole thing. I had to re-remember how to install the right version of Ruby and how to redeploy it. And uh, I, I'm going through just like, okay, what's what's the first thing to do? Let me check the VPSs and see if they're down. And they're down. And like the, the, the virtual private server that is, I have two of them running on a site called Chunk Host. Um, just because they were really cheap when I was setting it up. It's like $8 a month or something. And both of those say they're restarting and they're not coming back up. 
with me looking at it for several minutes. So I go into just emergency mode of like, oh man, okay, I need to re-remember how to like spin a, a server up. And if I had been running on something like Heroku, this would have been trivial because I think it just would have been handled for me automatically. I'm running Rails on a self-hosted version of Heroku called Doku uh, because it's way cheaper and the performance is way faster. When I looked into switching to Heroku at one point, uh, it was going to be like 10 times more expensive and the benchmarks were like 50 times slower. <laughs> and I couldn't do that. Uh, I, I couldn't pay more and get a worse product. So uh, it's... <laughs> the the system right now is just this cobbled together thing of all these different things and it works really well when it's working but then when it breaks it's, it's up to me to fix it and i've got to go in there and, and figure out what's going on um so what i ended up doing was uh buying a new server like provisioning a new virtual private server from uh digital ocean i think or linode mm -hmm. and hot swapping that out with the the old broken servers and in the process i had to re-figure out how to deploy on doku again and like set that up from scratch and i was able to get it back up within about an hour and a half and that felt kind of cool but in the process of doing that like i i had to retouch all of the different pieces of file inbox the way that it is and it's just massively complicated it's <laughs> terrible it's like i've got i've got Virtual private servers running on three different clouds, which part of that's for redundancy, but it's it's like really complicated when something breaks to try to figure out which which server is it and where is it. Um, and all of those are running different operating systems and different versions of Doku. <laughs> and I think they're also all running different versions of my app. It's kind of miraculous that that all works together. So that's like one layer. And then those, for those to be able to talk to a client, they get proxied through uh, cloud Cloudflare, which then load balances. But I figured out in the process of doing this that the load balancer was broken. So it just Oops. thought all the servers were down and it was going to the fallback. So I fixed that. So we've got servers and we've got Cloudflare. And then on top of that, I have a CDN. But I think the CDN isn't being used. I think it's just going through Cloudflare. And then, so that's that's the application layer. Uh, and then the, the domain names are managed by uh, Amazon on Route 53. And then the databases, I have a Redis database and I have a Postgres database. And the Redis database is hosted through some Redis hosting company. And the Postgres database is hosted through uh, the AWS hosted database thing. And while I was doing this, I had this process in the back of my head going like, oh man, all of this could be replaced with Firebase. <laughs> and I, I would just be one Firebase app and it would be in one place. And if it goes down, it would be much less likely it would go down in the first place. But if it goes down, I would just put my hands up and be like, well, it's down. <laughs> it's coming back up when Firebase fixes itself. Uh, and as far as I know, that's relatively rare. It happens like once every two or three years or something for a couple of hours. And when it happens, it's like, okay, the entire internet went down. So uh, it's okay that, that your app went down too. And going through that experience has relit a fire underneath me to recode this app in serverless. So I spent several hours this last week, like really enjoying putting work into replacing this huge monstrous machine that touches a whole bunch of different systems with one single, oh, it's this thing and it's hosted by Firebase and Firebase handles all the complexity for me. And I'm very excited about that. Uh, that's my story of what <laughs> happened to me this last week. Yeah, it's like you had gone through this pain in the past, and so you had this idea you had to move to Firebase, but you forgot all the pain yep. <laughs> because that's what happens. And now you've remembered it all again, and yep. now you're in a better place to actually move. So that's great. Um, it's also why I use Heroku, because even though it's more expensive and slower, because there is a single command to restart everything, and if it doesn't come back up, you say, Heroku's down. I don't know what yep. to do. <laughs> um, yeah. And so, uh, good. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully you can get far enough to actually get it uh, on a Firebase, and uh, I'm rooting for you. Thank you. I have a question for you on hosting on Heroku. Mm -hmm. Is your infrastructure just Heroku? Like you have your database on Heroku and you have your Redis database on Heroku? And Yep. Okay. Yeah. The, the additional things that you need that I have are, I mean, you still need the domain name somewhere else. Yeah. You, If you want email sending, then I use SendGrid for that. So you need something to send yeah. emails. Um, uh, what else? Oh, you might still have Cloudflare. So Heroku, as far as I know, doesn't have all the like, CDN and DDoS protections that Cloudflare has. Mm -hmm. um, so you still may want something like that. 
Um, which does Firebase have that? I guess they probably do. I mean, they're Google, they do. Yeah, so, they have yeah, their own CDN. Okay. And then also, uh, I, I think I would actually host on Vercel, and mm-hmm. Vercel also does sharding of your cloud functions. So uh, you can have your cloud functions spread out all across the globe, and someone in Australia is hitting Cloudflare servers uh, in Australia when they're calling a function. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it sounds very similar to except you'd be using. Firebase is the back end instead of Heroku is the back end. Yeah. I mean, yeah. so you have Firebase and Vercel, whereas on Heroku, you just have Heroku. Yeah. Y- yeah. You do have like add ons, though. So you have to add an add on to make Redis work, but it's all still managed through Heroku's interface. Mm. Cool. That would be another viable option. And I don't know. I think I'm, I'm, I'm in love with the elegance of serverless stuff, the idea that it can just infinitely scale different pieces of it although like on heroku i guess i guess heroku also can auto scale you can just tell it like if the load is higher just spin up more dinos yeah yeah you can um it gets expensive though like it is expensive um so if you you know if you get ddos and you don't have cloudflare or something then you spin up more dinos and then just waste money so yeah yeah i hadn't thought about heroku seriously in this uh that would also be a viable option to figure out just how to take this existing code base and go to Heroku. And I'm not going to do it because that doesn't excite me in the way that yep. <laughs> recoding everything in React and uh, putting it on Firebase does. Something that's really... Man, I, I wonder if I'm going to be eating my words later of like, what, what was I thinking? <laughs> I didn't do the back of the envelope calculation of how expensive this would be. And uh, you know, now I can't run basic queries on my database, uh, but I'm... I'm very bullish on it right now. I'm, uh, I don't know. Serverless is just really cool. And the idea particularly of taking way more of your application logic and pushing that to the front end and really just using your back end as a database API layer and then doing just the minimal amount of things that actually have to happen on the server, like billing, um, that it's a, it's a very romantic idea to me, like in application architecture that it, it makes the most sense to me. Yeah. I, I would recommend doing this back of the envelope cal- calculations. Uh, but to me, like from the outside looking in, it seems like most of your cost is like shuttling files around, right? Like yeah. storage of files and stuff. And so that's yeah, yeah. unrelated to like your date. Like you don't have billions of rows in a database, I imagine. So I don't, yeah, I don't see database costs as being a lot. Yeah, I agree. There's going to be a lot of really cool things I get for free too of like reactivity. Like, you know, when someone's uploading you a file, if you happen to be logged in at the time, just for free, you're going to be able to see, oh, someone's uploading a file and it's called this and it's this percent done. Um, and that's just, that's something that would be very difficult to do in Rails. You, it, It's become much easier with things like uh, the, the WebSocket layer. They have action yeah. cable, I think. Action, action cable. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I had to Wait. put, I'd have to put thought into it. And for a feature like that, I'd be like, well, no one's actually going to use this. I'm not going to do it. And if it's something that is just already happening, like, yeah, all right, why not? <laughs> like, it, it would it would kind of be harder not to do this than to do it because everything by default is uh, updating in real time. Yeah, which WebSockets, even through Action Cable on Heroku, are tricky at best. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. Cool. Pages loading instantly also because it'll all be a next application why for for new projects you seem to be uh also using rails is is there a reason you haven't but you know you're you're also well versed in react and all the new fun stuff is there a reason why you've stuck with rails as a as the thing you use for new projects yeah so some of it's just momentum so i have this sort of template that i built up over years and years of like all the different things i need in a project and so mm-hmm. i can get a new project up and running in like an hour um, with this, with billing and everything, users, everything's already there. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I already have all that stuff. The other is I have, I have tried several different like JS frameworks and, and all sorts of things. Um, I have like Netlify apps running. Um, I have other things and I keep going back to rails just because of all the batteries included stuff. Like it has mm-hmm. just everything, everything you need for a web app rails has, um, or, or, you know, has a plugin for, uh, or I mean a gym for, um, so yeah, it just has everything. And I've used it so much that I just know it's ins and outs. And so like everything else is work to learn. Um, now, maybe it would be better if I spent more time learning this stuff. But yeah, Rails and React does everything that I need a web app to do. So if someone was trying to learn how to build a web app for a software as a service today, would you still recommend Rails? 
Um, if you don't, if you know JavaScript and you don't know Ruby, then I would probably direct you to some JavaScript stuff like you're doing first. Um, if you know Ruby or want to learn Ruby, then yeah, absolutely. Rails is great. Cool. That would be a good clip to put on our Twitter. That's a question I've seen around a lot and something people in the Rails community talk about a lot is, to, is this a framework that still makes sense to learn? Like definitely if you already have your kit and you, you are familiar with all the batteries included tools that that's the fastest way forward but if you're starting from scratch and you're going to have to learn something new anyway um does it still make sense i would agree i think it does and I, I think i would make a slightly stronger statement that like i don't know that it matters the language that you already know especially if you're new to programming you, you when you're learning a language it's it's a much more superficial understanding of how the language works it's really just the syntax of how you go through for loops and things um but the batteries included aspect of rails it they really make it easy to do things the right way and yeah things like billing is just fixed and solved and people have been doing it for decades and so there's there's easy ways to just take whatever function you're trying to do of your web app and and uh bring it in yeah um yeah. oh especially for things like uh oh andrew culver's bullet train have you taken a look at that yeah so bullet trains one there's a few of them um yeah so these are frameworks basically like what i have built up myself uh you can buy and so yeah you can basically buy a SaaS starter kit for you know it's like 100 bucks or something yeah um, and everything just kind of works but it sounds yeah. like you've built your own version of that you have your yeah own. pretty much yeah cool yep yeah yeah i mean even i was gonna say stuff like um even stuff like migrations, like database migrations. Um, I have used several JavaScript frameworks that try to do migrations and they all are terrible. Like, yeah. I don't know like how, like they're so bad. Um, and Rails just gets them right, like totally right. Yeah. And um, yeah, stuff like that. It's just so, so good. Yeah, I'm gonna miss migrations. That's something that's gonna be really tricky to do in Firebase. I'm gonna have to like imperatively write a loop through the database if, if ever I wanna change. Mm -hmm how something's working um that part i'm not super excited about but it's not something i do very frequently and sure, yeah. because i don't like like i can just be adding arbitrary values to the database <clears throat> excuse me on the fly um so i think the times when i would need to go through and run a, a database migration are going to be going away um all right, cool. Uh, anything else to say about Rails and React and on, on that line? Uh, no, I don't think so. No. Then it's time for the next installation of Dude, Where's My Car? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, this last week, had in hand a return certified letter that had been attempted for delivery 10 days ago, which if you remember, is the criteria I needed to be able to submit a police report. And I thought, all right, here we go. Here's how this is going to go down. <laughs> I'm going to call the police and I'm going to say, hey, I have a 10-day letter. And they're going to be like, what? You have a 10-day letter? Oh, w w we'll have someone there right away, sir. <laughs> and they're going to come and pick it up and be like, she stole your car? That's terrible. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to track her down. And then not 15 minutes later, uh, I get a call from an officer and the officer's like ah we found your car sir and <laughs> this woman is going to jail and i and then i could be like oh no 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 i she shouldn't go to jail maybe, maybe just tell her not to steal cars anymore um <laughs> this this was the fantasy i had in my head as i uh as i called the police department and was told uh yes you can submit a police report you can either go to the station or we can send someone to your house and i thought oh well I don't want to trouble you too much. I'll, I'll go to the station. So I go to the station and I see a woman at the front desk uh, and she seems very like confused why I'm there. And I'm like, hello, I would like to submit a police report for a stolen vehicle, please. And she says, okay, write your name here. And so I do. And she goes to the back and she has a conversation with someone and she's like, yeah, he's here to submit a police report about a stolen vehicle. <laughs> okay and she says yeah they're on lunch right now uh so <laughs> it might be like 20 minutes and i was like oh okay it's fine I, i've got an audiobook i can wait so about 
40 minutes later, I'm like, hey, I need to go because I have a thing I'm doing, but I, I'll be back. Like, I can, I'll, I'll come back after lunch. I guess they're just having a really long lunch. And she's like, oh, yeah, okay. So I do the thing and I come back uh, about two hours later. And she says, ah, didn't I see you here the other day? And I said, <laughs> yes, you did. She saw me not, not two hours ago, ma'am. And she said, oh, did anyone ever come and help you with your stolen car? And I was like, no, no, they didn't. But I'm here again now. She said, oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll call them again and tell them to come out here. Uh, so she calls someone again, and I'm waiting there uh, about another hour. And <laughs> I'm just... I'm just hanging out in the uh, in the waiting room. It's an empty waiting room. There, I, I don't think this is usually what people do <laughs> to submit a police report. And she, she she pokes her head out. It's the way it's situated is like she's behind a desk that's that's like two desks away from the window. Uh, and I'm just sitting there typing on my laptop, just like uh, recoding the serverless version of Violent Box. And uh, she comes to the window and she's like, "Oh, you're still here." <laughs> Has no one come to help you with your police report? And I said, no, ma'am, they they have not. And she's like, oh, l- let me give them a call for you. So she gives them a call. And she's like, yeah, they're, nobody's coming. They're, <laughs> there was a wreck on I-35. And you should, uh, you know what you should do? You should go to the South Station. Because here at the North Station, this is just like where people come to have lunch and hang out. But at the South Station, they have an officer there all the time who's there to submit police reports. So I said, ah, oh, th- there's my mistake. Uh, thank you so much. So the next day, I go to the South Station, <laughs> and uh, I walk inside, and I see a place where an officer, I think, could be, but it's closed. There's no one in there. So I go around the corner uh, to this other desk, and I say, hello, I'm trying to submit a police report. Is this the place to do it? And uh, she said, oh, yeah, you, you go see the officer uh, over in that glass box, and he'll help you do it. And I said, ah, see, there's the problem, though. There's no one in that glass box. <laughs> And and she says, oh, well, what you need to do then is go to the phone on the far side of the box and dial the number there, and they will send someone out to you (laughs) just to let them know there's no officer there. And I said, oh, okay, of course. (laughs) What was I thinking? So I go over to the phone, and I'm talking with a woman there. And uh, as I I give her like half my information, uh, and an officer comes in uh, who I I had seen this guy in the parking lot. Uh, He was... (laughs) ironically picking up lunch uh and he walks into the glass box and so i say to the woman on the phone hey uh just kidding it seems like there's an officer here so uh thank you for your help but uh have a good day she says oh great uh so i hang up the phone and as i'm walking around the officer walks back out of the box (laughs) and starts walking away (laughs) and i'm like uh excuse me excuse me officer i'm i'm trying to submit a police report are you can you help me with that and he said ah I'm off duty, <laughs> so no. Uh, and he keeps walking away. And I said, okay, thank you. <laughs> so I go back to the phone, and I call back the number. And I say, hello, I think I may have just been talking to you. Uh, I'm trying to submit a police report, please. And she said, oh, that, that officer didn't help you. And I said, no, ma'am, he, he is off duty. <laughs> and so she said, oh, okay. Well, we can send someone out, but it's going to take about three hours. And I said, oh, okay. <laughs> what should I be doing instead? And she said, well... Usually people only come to the department if they don't want people, like, snooping around their house. But, like, you could also just call someone to your house. And I said, oh, great. Okay. Can I can I do that now? And then I'll, like, meet them back at my house. I'm about 20 minutes away. And she said, no. <laughs> you have to be at your house before you can call because they might get there really quickly, uh-huh. which I think is just the funniest thing ever. <laughs> After going through this, the idea that an officer could beat me back to my house is absurd. But I say, okay, fine. I, I'm going to keep going through this process. We're going to see what happens. Uh, so I have like I have like a 30-minute turnaround time then at home. So I'm like, well, it doesn't make sense to call someone now, so I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. So the next day, in the morning, I'm like, all right, I've cleared out this entire day. I'm going to be here the entire day. <laughs> I'm, I'm making snacks. I've got my work. I've I'm, I've printed out all the different documents of this thing. Uh, so I call the police and I say, hello, I've been trying to submit a police report for two days now. And I uh, sure would like a police officer to come and help me report my stolen car. And she says, you've been waiting for two days. What? What? <laughs> and I said, well, first I went to the North Station and they said to go to the South Station. And then I went to the South Station and they said to, to, to go to it. So I'm here now. So I hang up with her and she's like yeah we'll we'll send someone over but he's he's doing a thing now uh and not 10 minutes later 
there's a knock on my door. And I open the door and I'm like, oh my gosh, officer, hello. I didn't expect you so soon. <laughs> and he uh, says, yeah, hello. What's what's the problem? And I was like, oh, my car was stolen. And uh, we go through the whole thing. And he has, just like in the detective movies, he's got a little notepad. Mm-hmm. And he's writing down the information. And he's like, all right, what's, what's this woman's name? And what's her address? And what's her phone number? And... Uh, Oh, th- this is a this is a civil matter. And I'm like, no, 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 because I sent the ten day letter. And he's like, oh, okay, well, it might still be civil. Uh, and then he uh, came back later in the day and was like, ah, we actually need you to upload some of those documents that you showed us, like the ten hmm. day letter and the uh, the chat transcript that you have, uh, where this woman just stops talking to you. So I did. So that was yesterday, and I think what happens now is nothing, and I never see my car again. And that's the update of, uh, dude, where's my car? <clears throat> yeah, that, that, you, you have a way of telling stories, which is fantastic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I uh, I kind of saw that coming, I guess. Um, <laughs> I've had a couple interactions with police in the past for things like that. Uh, our hubcaps were stolen once, which is super oh. annoying. And because they're like, they were like special clippy hubcaps and so you have to buy them from the thing and they were like two hundred dollars and it's like the whole thing gross and i submitted a we submitted a police report which we had to wait two and a half hours for the guy to come to the panera where we were at and uh then i heard absolutely nothing (laughs) ever about that yep um and then i had my wallet stolen once from a locker and i submitted a police report for that it it was on a college campus and a detective came like several days later took my statement and then Oh, and then for that one, I actually got a letter saying oh. I caught the guy, oh. and, I would, and I was going to get my money back through like restitution or whatever. And then wow. heard exa- exactly nothing for twelve years. <laughs> twelve. So. Hold on. Does that, do you mean to imply you heard something twelve years later? No, I heard something twelve years ago. Um, okay. And never got any money. Um, okay. Oh, uh, uh, we're up to the present now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're still holding out hope that you, that you might get that forty dollars from from college. Uh, oh, I'm going to get it. Um. Yeah, I guess he was, he, he, uh, they, it was, it's kind of an interesting story. So he worked at the facility and he would just wait around the locker rooms and look for someone to leave. And then he'd go and check all the lockers for stuff. Um, and they caught him cause he worked there. Yeah. <laughs> like they, he, like he was on, he was the only person in the building for like 13 thefts. Um, wow. so it's like, ah, it's pretty easy to know who that was. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so they caught the guy, but I'm assuming he has no money and couldn't pay back whatever, you know, yeah. <laughs> whatever. So anyway my dad it's like uh squeezing blood from a stone or something right right yeah um i've also moved since then so it's entirely possible i have 40 dollars to my name and some you know state website that i have to go claim or something <laughs> yeah um he, he was nice though he took the money and threw away the wallet and so i was able to find my wallet so he just oh. got cash yeah um okay. i actually i didn't find it at first in the in the in the on-campus security guy was like check the trash because i presumably had done that before yeah yeah and so yeah um, hold on was the yeah. on-campus security guy no, no, no. A different person. Not the person D- who committed the theft. Okay, okay. Different guy. Different guy. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe you should check that trash can over <laughs> right. there. Exactly. <laughs> um. Anyway, I, I I made that all about uh me. I'm sorry about your car. I uh, hopefully you get it back. Um, I'm sorry about your wallet and your hubcaps. I <laughs> I don't think you'll get them back. But <laughs> no, I don't think I, so. I hope you do. Uh, yeah. I have a question for you. This is uh the the discussion that's been going around my family uh for the last few days what do you think i should do next on one (sighs) side of the debate we have people like my dad who's like oh you know where she lives just drive up at like two in the morning and take your car back and then we have people like sarah my girlfriend very concerned for my safety uh who's like don't do anything and it's okay it's just a car uh which i think is reasonable uh the the one extra detail I'll, I'll add before you answer i'm getting tolls charged on my account to this car and she's driving it she's going through like 50 dollars a week in tolls uh it's impressive but i think i can resolve that just by calling the toll company and being like hello my car was stolen and it really was because i have a police report uh it's i i think the car is worth about three thousand dollars but it might be a little more because of this weird used car shortage we have. And it would be work for me to sell it. And like that, that would be a whole thing. Uh, and 
I would like to not put myself in danger. Uh, these are the things I'm considering. What What do you think I should do? Uh, yeah, I would not go get it for two reasons. One is because of this weird thing with higher car and stuff, it, it may actually be, not be legal for you to go take it like from her property. Oh. Uh, like, like I, I mean, I, I, I have no idea like what yeah, yeah. agreement you and her signed with higher car, right? Yeah. Something I'd consider. Um, so I w would not do that also because yeah, you never know who has uh, a gun or something, right? Like she yeah. sees you on your property and shoots you <laughs> like, yep. I wouldn't go get it. Um, the other thing. I was going to say is the next thing I would do, well, yeah, call it, call it toll thing and just cancel the tolls. Um, that might be enough to like get her to say, Hey, this isn't working on the toll road anymore. <laughs> um, and then, uh, the other thing I'll do is call your insurance company and ask what documents you need and how much time needs to pass before you can claim it. Um, mm -hmm. cause for three grand, you can just claim it uh, mm -hmm. on your insurance, um, and get some money from your insurance company. That's what I'll do. I have just like the basic cheapest basic insurance that is a conversation i'd like to have with my insurance company though i think i've been a little afraid of calling them because i'm afraid they'll be like you rented out your car on the mm. internet this uh, is not yeah. in our terms <laughs> we're canceling all of your insurance um but like I'm, I'm with geico and geico has been really cool in the past so i think i maybe uh making a, a mountain out of a molehill um and like, yeah, that that seems to be one of the only parties in this that's actually on my side because like, <laughs> I'm paying them money to help me with situations in this category. Yeah, but they don't uh, want to pay you more. They don't want to pay you money. <laughs> so <laughs> no, they don't. They're not really on your side. No. But I guess I, I'd like to hope they'd be more motivated than like. Th they at least have standard procedures for this thing. Like, yeah, cars get stolen yeah. every day. They get claimed on insurance. So you just call them and say, "What documents do I need? And how long do I have to wait before whatever?" Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, next week I will have updates on what my conversations with my insurance company and the toll company have been. And uh, I will most certainly be telling you about how I still don't have my car, even though, <laughs> man, it's so painful. I know who she is. Yeah. I have her driver's license. I know what her address is. Like, I, oh, man, when I was uploading the documents to the, the, police report i like labeled each of them and i like mm -hmm. had arrows and uh, each document is is titled and it's like here's the, her current address and here's where she was and here's this record of this and it just seems like the sort of thing i understand there are people like getting shot and there are active murderers on the loose in my city uh and that that is objectively more important than a three thousand dollar stolen car but like Oh, I sure would get some faith in society if something happened. Um, honestly, if I just if I just got the letter you got for your wallet that was like we caught the guy, <laughs> and you might get your money back, like I'd feel at peace. <laughs> I'd be like, all right, this justice justice exists in the world. Uh, yeah, my dad was so mad. He was like, these low lifes stealing stuff. You can't trust anybody you gotta you gotta go teach her a lesson and uh i'm not gonna do that uh okay cool that's yeah. that's the update the, the other thing is like car theft is not nothing and so it's going to be someone's job like someone at the police department now has a number next to their name with your case file in it and yeah. they have to close it so they yeah. either have to close it by doing nothing and then just close <laughs> it uh or they the obvious thing is send up they know the address so they probably send a patrol car to the address like that's yeah. my guess um, so yeah, it is, it is now someone's job to close that number in there and, you know, uh, to make their number go down. Um, so you might hear from the police still. So. Cool. Well, I'm excited. I'll, I'll keep you updated. <laughs> All right. Let you know on the next episode of dude, where's my car? Uh, I have one more thing I wanted to mention briefly, uh, which is that I went to physical therapy for my shoulder. I dislocated it, uh, about four months ago and uh, it was very painful, and I noticed that I have drastically decreased mobility. And when I went to see the physical therapist, he said, "Ah, oh, it's going to be fine. Like, don't worry about it." And oh, what have you heard about physical therapy? It's very painful. Ah, that's, those are just stories. This is going to be great. Uh, all right, re reach your arms over your head for me. Oh, okay. Uh, reach them to the side. Oh, oh no. Mm. Oh, reach them behind your back. Oh boy. <laughs> uh, you have frozen shoulder, and all the things I told you about no pain—that's not true. You're, this is going to be very painful. Um, and he showed me these exercises to do 
to just slowly stretch out my shoulder in on, on the, the axes that it's the most frozen. So uh, for f three separate sessions of 15 minutes a day now, I'm just like holding these poses of, I, <laughs> I have to take this broom handle and like push my arm up above my shoulder and then take it and push my arm to the side and then lay on my side and then pull it inward. And the way that he described how I should be thinking about this is like, like stretching out cold taffy where mm -hmm. like, if I try to do it really quickly, nothing's going to happen. Uh, or in the worst case, if I pull hard enough, it'll shatter or, or break or something. So I just got to be real slow and just like take, take the taffy and just like pull it just like very slowly. And then eventually it's going to give, and then you're, you're going to get mobility back. And I really like that analogy because it feels a lot like business. It feels a lot like marketing and like talking to customers of it's a, it's a, it's a cold engine that you're just trying to put enough juice into that, that it'll start spinning on its own. But to do it, you just have to put like incremental move. You just gotta be pushing it and you just gotta be going and just like three times a day for an hour a day, talk to customers. And by doing that incremental work every single day, that's how you stretch out the cold taffy and that's how you, you get the engine running. Uh, and I feel like in the process of doing this, I'm learning patience. And even though it's a little bit painful and it's hard by putting that in, and, and it's difficult to see progress uh, cause it's happening very slowly. That's the way that you get this sort of thing done. So I have a new mental model for getting stuff done. Yeah. I like that too, uh, because it's, yeah, as you're working the taffy, eventually it'll become easy again. But you have to put in all the stretching where almost nothing is happening. Um, yep. Yeah, that's a neat model for, uh, for yeah, I think like content marketing for business. Perfect example, right? Um, cool. Yeah, I'm gonna use that in my brain next time I'm writing a blog. For SEO especially, yeah, that that makes sense. You just have to put the work in, keep writing the articles, and then eventually things start happening slowly, and then eventually they start happening really quickly and then you have a fully mobile shoulder again which i'm very excited for chris unfortunately that's all i got that's all i got too then i'll see you next week goodbye